You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 327. And in this one, I chat with Elise Petronzio about her OCD story. So we discuss her OCD themes, we chat about mental compulsions, compassion, the problem with comparing recovery journeys, learning to manage her workload, we discuss her advocacy brand Octopus, or spell O-C-D-O-P-U-S, being an advocate, when family don't understand, words of hope, and much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers affordable, effective, and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. So thank you so much to Elise for sharing her story. I deeply appreciate it. And thank you to you guys for listening. As always, it means a lot. And without further ado, here is Elise. Welcome to the show, Elise. Uh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Um, so as you know, I'd love to hear your OCD story. So you can go into as little as much detail as you want. Sure. Um Let's see. All right. Starting back. So I'm 25 now. Um, My OCD story would begin probably when I was six. Um, I started to have tendencies, I would say. And my first grade teacher uh, told my parents during a parent teacher conference. um, She was like, Lisa's is asking every day if she has a fever. She's a great student, but she asks that every single day. And they were like, she'll grow out of it. Um, I did not grow out of it (laughs) still to this day. I feel like that's still something that I think about. Um, And then when I was nine, I went on a family vacation and I felt sick Mm -hmm. physically. And then I kind of just woke up and I had a very intense onset of OCD. Um, I started doing a lot of compulsions, uh, just right compulsions. Um, I had a metaphobia, which I know is related to OCD. Um, I was afraid of not being able to fall asleep at night. So whole big mess. Um, and then I, let's see, I did get into therapy when I was young. So I was very lucky. Um, they didn't diagnose me with OCD though. So I didn't know I had OCD for 10 years. So um, what- I so yes. just to quickly jump in there, what what did they sort of diagnose you with or think was the issue? Um, so my therapist, I don't remember ever actually using the word anxiety, but my mom and my family called it anxiety. Okay. So I walked around thinking I had an anxiety disorder that was causing me to have all these really weird thoughts and hmm. compulsive behaviors, which anxiety is part of it, like the feeling. Hmm. <laughs> but um it was when I got older and I got into advocacy and I started meeting more people talking about anxiety. And I was like, Oh, these people don't think about like knives and stuff. Like that's not, (laughs) we're not the same people. Um, and then that eventually I got the OCD diagnosis after that. Um, I was actually just thinking this morning about how your podcast is seven years old, right? Almost. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually still wasn't diagnosed when the podcast started. So I was like, that's interesting. But um, yeah, so they, my mom would call it anxiety. It was a lot of similar ideas, like making sure that the OCD was separate from me, but we just called it anxiety. Um, And I wasn't told that it was chronic or anything like that, which I think was helpful. Uh, So I did well for like a year and a half. And then of course it came back. Mm -hmm. Um, I started having disturbing intrusive thoughts when I was like 12 I was pretty young um and then that I would go back to him and then thoughts would come back in a new theme and I'd go back to him all this time not being told that it was OCD or that other people had thoughts like this he wasn't focused on that at all um and I didn't really get treated for mental compulsions I feel like which then made it worse 
down the line. Um, and then when I started having very specific um, harm OCD thoughts, uh, my friend and I at the time, we Googled it. And that's when we found pure OCD. Um, and then I didn't pursue a clinical diagnosis, but then I ended up starting with a new therapist and they were like, do you have any other diagnoses? And I was like, I have OCD. And they're like, did anyone diagnose you with that? And I was like, I did. And she's like, let's do the Y box just to be sure. And then she's like, you're right. You have OCD. I was like, oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know too well. And yeah, that after that, um, I went to the IOCDF conference in 2018 for the first time. And then that's kind of how I got into the OCD advocacy community also from there yeah yeah okay that, that yeah well you got there in the end you know it is a, <laughs> a twisty journey but so when you were was it 10 did you say you, you first went into therapy yeah i was yeah. yeah i was 10 by the time i yeah. got there yeah yeah okay and um so they they roughly identified it as anxiety as far as we can gather were you doing like erp around or was it yeah. So this always confuses me. I wouldn't say it was formal. It was definitely not formal ERP the way that some people talk about it now where it's like it's timed, it's repetitive, mm. it's planned. Um, all I remember, so my biggest thing was I was afraid of staying up late, probably because I thought it would make me sick. Um, so all my compulsions were about trying to fall asleep earlier. Mm. And my therapist, I remember him talking to me. And he was like, and I was a, I was a smart adolescent. So when he said this to me, it made me angry, but he was like, so what happens at midnight if you're not asleep? And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, do you turn into a pumpkin? And I'm like, of course I know that I don't turn into a pumpkin. Yeah. I, I just don't know. Like pointing out the logic mm. side of it, I guess. And he was like, okay, well, if you don't turn into a pumpkin, then prove it. And he was like, stay up. So I did the exposure part, but um, I don't think the response prevention was very well yeah, flushed out, yeah. which is the theme that has followed me my entire life. I'm very good at forcing myself into anxious mm -hmm. situations, but I'm not so good at the response prevention, which is apparently okay. the most important part. Mm. But it yeah. did work well when I was younger, because once I wasn't afraid, I felt less of a need to do the compulsions until the theme change then it didn't work anymore because i was afraid again yeah true yeah that's interesting and um so wh where are you at now would you say like how, how are you doing um so let's see i wouldn't say it's the dream um i'm trying to work a lot on mental compulsions that tends to be my big issue um mm -hmm. i went a couple of years obsessing about things like my career, where I'm going to live, like living the perfect life is kind of what it's morphed into. Um, and it wasn't identified as OCD because I wasn't with an OCD specialist. Mm -hmm. So I would just spend hours researching stuff and I didn't realize that I was just feeding into the problem. So I'm trying to unpack that, which I just got into an OCD specialist literally this week. Cool. Um, I do find so. As many people know, it can be hard to find affordable treatment. I've definitely had that problem. I have a very obscure, different insurance that's not taken by most people. So I had to go out of network, but I am finally able to do that. So hopefully we have some gains there and I'm excited. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. And is that local or is that going to be online? So it is online, but they're within my state, but it's an hour and a half drive away. Okay. So I was like, we'll do telehealth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it makes sense. Um, okay, cool. So fingers crossed. That's what's positive. Yeah. Know? Um, yeah. And how are you? Because obviously mental compulsions trip a lot of people up because they're just so hard to see because they're in our head, you know? Yeah. Um, is there any way you are currently trying to work on them or notice it or anything like that? I definitely think noticing rumination is a big uh, task for me right now and mm. redirecting away. Um, I also, so I do have mental compulsions for sure. I also think that they do kind of manifest physically at times, like with researching this more of a physical act 
Yeah. Um, but noticing that I'm doing that and noticing how long it's been, maybe setting a timer. Um, I also do a lot of self reassurance, which happens so fast that I think the best option for me is to undo it. Mm. Like doing something to bring the anxiety back. Just, that's the thing with mental compulsions. They just happen so quickly. Like, I feel like I've done five before I even realize that I've done one. Um, so I'm doing it, I think, is a big piece that I could use and also just being aware of it. Those are probably the two biggest parts yeah. right now. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And yeah, and that's it. And it's like you said, it, it can happen so quick that you've done five or six and then it's like, oh, damn, you know, I've just done. Um, but it's at that point not beating yourself up and being mm-hmm. like be it, celebrating that you caught it even if it was an hour of rumination, be grateful that you caught it at an hour, you know, and then it's two hours. Be grateful if it's 10 minutes, if it's one second. Um, Cause yeah. I think it's too easy to like just beat ourselves up. Yeah. The compassion piece is definitely something I'm also going to be working on. Mm. Okay. If you feel you need that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm like, <laughs> I like compare myself and this is interesting too, because I am very active in the online advocacy mm-hmm. community and it can actually be very hard hearing how people are recovered and don't fit the criteria for OCD anymore. And if that's great, like super happy for them, but it's very hard to hear um, as someone who's had it for so long. I'm like, I should be better by now. I should have done this or that. I should know what I'm doing. I'm an advocate. Why do I not know what I'm doing? But that doesn't really get me anywhere having those thoughts. So the compassion piece is big for me, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I get the comparison too. Like, um, we humans, we we do it in every area of life, right? Um, why don't I have a nicer car or house or whatever it is? Um, so with the com- comparing of of you know one's suffering compared to someone else's, it, you know, you can see it on social media and be like, well, why have they recovered quicker and I've had it for so long? But then also there is, you know, as a therapist, I can say there are so many factors that go into someone's recovery like what what, sorry what makes their suffering so other people have family stuff that kind of fuels the OCD or makes it harder to work on or maybe there's comorbidities or it's or there's like self-esteem issues and that plays into recovery or there's a million and one things that that mess and interfere with someone's recovery so on the surface yeah it's really we we compare and we're like why isn't it working for me but maybe that person just didn't have nowhere near as many variables to work on you know yeah no that's a good one I'll have to think about that after the podcast um definitely access alone is a huge one because Mm -hmm. I know people who have gone to residential and IOP and I looked into those options and it was thousands and thousands of dollars for me so I was like I'm not going Mm. yeah Yeah, I get it I get it absolutely we even in the UK we have socialized healthcare so you in theory get free therapy but even then sometimes you may not get the right therapist mm. or um you have to wait six months and then you may only get 12 sessions or which for some people maybe that's enough to start the ball rolling and for others it's not even going to make a dent um so yeah it's it's problematic on both sides of the ocean i think yeah um, i have found a couple tools I'm in my pursuit of affordable ERP. Mm. Um, And I did, so Open Path is a nonprofit in the U.S. that um, if you have financial hardship, they can help you. They kind of like take the sliding scale therapist and put them all in one place. Oh, cool. Um, And I feel like their rates are lower than the regular sliding scale. So that's actually what I did. Um, So I would recommend that to anyone because I was like, I didn't know this was here, but I saw it in a Facebook group for people in their 20s. Mm -hmm. So caught me off guard. And then advocate is another interesting thing I saw where um, you, because in the, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the US, a lot of ERP therapists are out of network. So you go to them, you get a receipt and then you, submit it to your insurance okay yeah. um an advocate but you still have to pay up front and then get reimbursed but advocate supposedly i've never used it so disclaimer on that but um 
<laughs> they make it so that you can pay your what you they make it so you can pay what you would pay after the reimbursement instead of having to wait for the reimbursement like they wait for you which could make it more affordable for some people too but again yeah. never used it but i did think it was interesting yeah yeah so if people are interested they can do their research and due diligence yeah um okay no but those are useful thank you for sharing those um sure. another one just to, to add to that list is like like going to a student you know a student therapist mm -hmm. trainee therapist that's if especially if it's within an ocd clinic they're supervised by people that treat ocd day in day out mm. um and usually students are up to date on the most recent research they're passionate they're, they're interested they work hard so i guess i share that for people not to kind of turn their noses up at the idea of a trainee um and then obviously they work at low much lower rates um yeah so i had that one in i'm sure there's a million more other ideas um so yeah what, what else helps you in your well-being like day-to-day -day around ocd or any anything else yeah i'm trying to trying to think i have some chronic physical health issues so i feel like i spend a lot of effort on thinking about well-being for that and ocd not as much which is interesting um i think the biggest thing right now is i'm trying to limit how much i put on my plate and fighting the urge to put a lot of things on my plate, yeah. even if I want to. Um, like I have my business, uh, The Octopus, which is an OCD advocacy and recovery shop. So I'm very passionate about that work. So it's very easy to run with it yeah. wildly. And I have to dial it back, even if I want to do five things in one day. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not going to feel good if I do five things in one day. Every day I have to do less. Um, so that's a big thing I'm focusing on right now. I'm um, also just the basic um, sleeping enough, yeah. eating consistently, uh, taking medications, drinking water. Because really, once you lose those things, everything starts to slide very quickly. Yeah. Um, and going to therapy, uh, making sure I get out socially. I never really understood the impact of that until the pandemic. I was like, oh, I actually benefit a lot from going out socially and even just going to the grocery store and talking to the cashier. Yeah. Like that is a social interaction that I need. So mm -hmm. making sure I get that in because I work remotely. So it can be hard to get that in sometimes. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think there's I'm glad you said it, like just taking care of the basics like sleep, water, nutrition, socialization, um, socializing. It's so, those things are so important. And, and if they slip, as you say, we suffer and we may not, may not realize it. Mm. Um, and obviously sometimes with sleep, some people really struggle, but where possible, like trying to get as much sleep as we can or the right amount of sleep, I should say. Um, cause some like people, that's triggering yeah. for yeah. me, the right amount of sleep. Well, yeah, yeah um, not to be too perfect about it. I only yeah, say that because yeah. I know for me, if I sleep too much, I feel worse. So that yeah. there's a set window of time that I find that's my like, if I can get that amount of hours, I'm really good. Yeah. Yeah. I do know that a lot of people with anxiety sometimes have trouble falling asleep. Yeah. And that's something I've always thought was funny about me. When I hit the bed, I feel like my body is just like, well, we got to sleep. So we have lots of energy to worry tomorrow. Like mm. I've only had a handful of nights in my life that I've been up all night thinking about something. Yeah. And I just thought that was always funny. Yeah. 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 I absolutely, I get it. I think for me, it's like, you know, if I'm really struggling to go to sleep, I'm obviously, I'm stuck in my head ruminating may, may not be ocd just ruminating generally about something in my day or and then it, it, trying to do like dropping anchor from acceptance commitment therapy which is pretty much a mindfulness exercise getting you into your senses uh, to your body you know and then in using your senses and, and trying to basically get a bit of distance from that that content um because sometimes help relax enough that you can start to fall asleep yeah no i won't even hide it i play lullabies like nice. the ones that you would play for yeah. a baby because i feel like if i have that music it gives my brain something to listen to besides yeah. itself 
Um, so I found that very helpful. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Well, you know, some many parents play like white noise to their babies or toddlers or, or yeah, like lullabies. And and then we we stop it at a certain age. I don't know why. If it works, yeah. it works, you know. I'm like, um, is this inner child work? Is yeah, it this could what be. they mean? <laughs> Probably is connecting with that that early age for you. Yeah, um, no, it's uh, it's awesome. I do. Yeah. I recommend the lullabies to everybody, adults too. Nice. Yeah, I do like if I can hear bird song, especially in the summer, and falling asleep to that, or even the rain. There's yeah, something quite calming about it. Uh, okay, so um, do do do. So yes, uh, let's talk about your advocacy initiative. Or brand octopus um spell ocd upus but said octopus anything mm-hmm. you want to say on that and why and why start it i guess yeah sure um so honestly yeah so the octopus it's spelled o-c-d-o-p-u-s oh, um, oh, yeah uh, yeah I just in yeah. case um <laughs> but yeah so um it's just a shop that has um apparel accessories um, stickers, all different things. And they kind of fall into two categories, either they're about OCD recovery or they help advocate for the disorder very directly, which honestly, even the recovery pieces help advocate because someone will see them and be like, what does maybe, maybe not have to do with anything? And where that's like a phrase that has a lot of meaning in the OCD community. So Um, One thing is that I do well with tangible reminders. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of things out there for positivity in general, um, but some of that stuff doesn't really translate well to OCD. For example, there's that ongoing quote that's like, you are what you think, you become what you think, you do like what you think. Um, And that's not very helpful for people with OCD. So I did think that we were in need of some specific um, tangible reminders for our recovery. Like I like to have stickers to remind me I can see um, like my values over fear sticker. And that helps remind me that maybe I'm thinking about a decision and I need to lean towards my values instead of doing what OCD tells me to do. Um. Yeah, so that's one thing. And then also in particular with OCD is the joke merch. I don't know many other disorders that get as much joke merch as OCD Mm. does. Like walking down the street, I look in a shop, I see obsessive chocolate disorder. I'm like, if you had any idea what OCD actually felt like, you would never put that up. And the comparison I always made was you would never see something for like HIV that said human ice cream virus. (laughs) People would be like, what is that? That's disturbing. Take that yeah. down. But, you know, with OCD, it's yeah. all good and fine and dandy, but it's mm. not. Um, so I just really like having merch as a way to specifically fight back against that. Um, like, for example, I know Target a couple years ago yeah. put out the OCD obsessive Christmas disorder stuff. And that was actually the first really big project campaign that the octopus did was um we have a shirt that very directly says ocd is not obsessive christmas disorder Mm -hmm. and like just walking through target with that shirt on is such a fun time but um yeah so i just really wanted something that empowers people with ocd i'm in a fun way yeah yeah i just feel like it's fun um subtle reminders you can have around your home and in your closet that remind you of what you're trying to do. And also it reinforces that there's a community around it because other people have that shirt somewhere too. So it's been really fun. I never expected it. Um, I didn't like have a dream of opening an OCD merchandise shop. It kind of just started with stickers and then it went to the OCD is not obsessive Christmas disorder. And now there's a hundred products and mm. I can't stop. And that's, <laughs> it's a good time though. I really yeah. like it. That's good. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it because that's the most important thing. Right. Um, and, uh, I was going to say, yeah, you know, that, as you say, there's been a lot of brands and you go on any of those stores that kind of anyone can kind of put designs up kind mm. of like Teespring or, yeah. 
Etsy, Etsy, Etsy. Etsy, exactly. Any of these, not to uh, pinpoint any of them, but many of them all have these types of products or obsessive coffee disorder. Yeah, um, that's another one. That's Cars, yeah, was... corgis. Oh yeah, <laughs> anything like, we listen, see. I like corgis, but stop doing that. I'm like, it's a, yeah. I've never. I mean, unless you're talking about bestiality, then corgis yeah. are usually not part of this. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and any anything that becomes a disorder is going to try and impact your life. So you don't even want corgi disorder because, <laughs> you know. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that, that there's so much of this out there and we can absolutely pull these down and we should in part. But I think the other way is create what you want to see. So, you know, you are then putting actually accurate and, and uplifting OCD mer- merchandise out there. And that's another way of drowning out some of this nonsense. Um, so yeah, well, well done on that. Thank so, you. No worries. How, how's it been received? The the brand. Um, it's been very well received. Um, I don't think I even realize how well received it's been because I I can't like there are businesses that make no money and no one buys their stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's just been very well received from the community from the very beginning which i'm very grateful for um it's been shipped to i think 15 countries now we're at 49 out of 50 u.s states if anyone um from north dakota is listening <laughs> yeah, i'm <laughs> sure know. we have a few yeah yeah but um it's been very well received and i'm very thankful i get a lot of really sweet messages of people telling me what it means to them which that never gets old like hearing why people um, like mm. having the merch. Uh, I've made a lot of friends through it. I've made a lot of really good connections. Um, yeah, it's just been really great overall. And I think the community does respond to it, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to hear. I always see the interaction on, on Instagram that you get. And obviously I'll put links to your website, Instagram, all of that in the show notes. So people can can check it out. Um, but yeah, you need to do like a, a discount code just for people in North Dakota. Yeah, like yeah. ND or something, just to get someone to buy to get that that final state. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, it's about it's a couple months away from being a year and a half old. And if we don't have yeah. North Dakota, we've had 49 states since like it turned a year old. We've been waiting on North Dakota for a very long time. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Okay. So anyone listening from North Dakota, check out the website. Uh, yeah. I and message us. I'll give you a discount code there to you go. help me out. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Maybe we should create a hashtag for that. Um, like a <laughs> campaign. Uh, okay. Now that's awesome. Is there anything else you want to say on Octopus before we move on? Um. I guess maybe the only thing I'll add is that I also feel like there's a really great community that's been built on Instagram um, and TikTok. I love TikTok, Mm. but um, we have something called Fridays where people can celebrate their um, weekly accomplishments with OCD. And it's really great seeing people get raw and honest about Mm. what they've been doing because a victory then might seem a victory that I could see someone stomping on who maybe doesn't have OCD and doesn't understand like someone, for example, I know today they're getting posted because they get posted on Fridays and someone went into a public bathroom. And like, what's nice is that our community understands that for some people that's monumental. Yeah. Um, so it's really great seeing people be able to come together in that way and feel safe enough to, tell us what they're actually accomplishing um, very specifically. So I would encourage you to check it out even for that reason. Um, We do have a pretty active advocacy community online. Um, Even if you don't buy anything from the shop, just getting involved would be great. Yeah, that's a good point. I do like that you guys do that. So it's not, you're not just selling stuff and there's nothing wrong with that, but you're also doing the other, like the Fridays and getting people uh, involved in that way um cool all right so going back to your story um Mm. were there any roadblocks that kind of got in your way other than not being diagnosed with OCD early enough (laughs) yeah um 
yeah, not being diagnosed led to not meeting anyone else, which is okay. definitely a roadblock. Um, let me see. How do I want to word this? Um, lack of understanding from family members is definitely a roadblock. Mm. Uh, they said some very problematic, hurtful things mm. in the moment um, that I did it on purpose, that I like doing it. I like obsessing and doing okay. compulsions and that's why I was doing it. Um, so that was obviously very unhelpful when I was yeah. a teenager and didn't know better because, you know, mm. you only have like who you're surrounded by to really give you cues, especially when you're younger. Um, so that was a roadblock, a lack of family education on it, I think, mm. which without the diagnosis, we didn't get the education. Um, sure. I'm like trying to think of roadblocks besides not getting the diagnosis because I feel like most of the roadblocks came after that. But also, yeah. I benefited a lot, I think, from not having the diagnosis at the same time. Okay. Because I thought it was just me. And it's easier to work on me than it is to work on a chronic illness that people tell you won't go away. Mm. So you, are you saying that actually it helped you improve who you were or work on yourself while you're waiting for that diagnosis so i think it helped me recover faster with more confidence because it okay. wasn't an illness for me oh, like i wasn't yeah, I told it. that it was a chronic illness that i was going to have forever yeah which i do feel like we talk about a lot in the ocd community or at least i hear that message a lot it's thrown out there a lot yeah yeah but um when i didn't know what it was it was just a quirk almost yeah. like that's how it felt which but then it came back so obviously long term that really wasn't a great strategy especially as i got older i think as a kid it was beneficial to not know all the details but yeah when i was a teen and i had the weird intrusive thoughts it would have been really nice to know someone else and then i went to the conference and i meet people who are like 20 minutes away from me mm. and i'm like where were you and even with the octopus people buy stuff and they're from town's like one town over and i'm like i wish i had known you were there do you hand deliver it no i never oh. hand deliver it. everyone's got to get it shipped <laughs> oh, okay fair enough <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah i really can't think of any other roadblocks right now but I'm no sure those are, are good some. yeah those are good um so flip side of that question um mm. was there a point where something just clicked either how you looked at ocd or how you looked at recovery from it um clicked being like made sense it just i oh, get it so quite honestly i feel like it clicked when i was younger and then it mm. unclicked and i'm okay. still trying to re-click but when i was younger um what clicked was i faced what i was actually afraid of that was fueling all the compulsions and I was like, wow, this really isn't worth doing all those compulsions. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I could handle any level of distress because it would eventually pass. Yeah. So I'm trying to channel my 10 year old yeah. self who was like really be a believer in e it was basically ERP in some ways. But yeah. I'm like, she she was very good at this. So I'm trying to channel that. But she really got it. I remember like doing things that scared me on purpose. Um, I remember because I've had a metaphobia my whole life. And when I was a kid, after I went through treatment for the first time, I was like, maybe I should make myself throw up just to get it over with. Like mm. I can do this, which I never did it. But um, like that attitude yeah. and just believing I can get through whatever happens. I think yeah. that was what clicked. And hopefully that'll click again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is something about young kids just have this incredible bravery um i think bravery is the right word they just they don't question it they're just like oh if this helps let me do it you know yeah when as soon I, as you hit teens adulthood you're like mm, let me think about it yeah when i was a kid i just did whatever he my therapist said and now yeah. i'm like now my ocd latches onto the therapist itself and i'm like this person know what they're doing maybe they don't know ocd maybe they're yeah. just wrong true 
I'm like, forget the degree, forget the experience they have. I'm like, they could be wrong. Yeah. Well, they could be just to keep you in the uncertainty. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, I have, I've had had therapists that were wrong. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess words of, words of hope for anyone listening with OCD or encouragement. Yeah. Um, I think that Every time, what I tell myself is every time I do a compulsion, I have a chance to do it differently. Or every time you have an obsession, you have a chance to undo it. You have a chance to catch the rumination and start over. So Mm -hmm. for every time you obsess and then compulse, it's another chance to change the direction. So that's something that always helps me. i um, definitely reframing the idea of like it being an opportunity instead of it being something to be ashamed of or feel bad about. Um, and I do feel like they are constantly coming up with new methods because I do know that not every um, intervention works for people with LCD. I believe that even as a population that doesn't benefit from ERP, if I'm correct. Yeah, based on the studies. I mean, we don't yeah. know who that population is, but we know that it, a certain percent in the in the trials don't get better, whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. Or even like maybe they just haven't found the right person or they didn't articulate what their obsessions are. But yeah, there's a million there's, variables. Yeah, there's tons of research happening all the time so if your thing hasn't come maybe it will or maybe you need to try tms um i've seen people talk about i don't know the acronym i think it might be dbs is the deep brain stimulation where they have the surgery um there's different medications being researched so lots of stuff is happening all the time um so just try to hang in there if your thing hasn't come yet like there's new resources all the time, like we were talking about with um how to get therapy. So yeah, there's always stuff coming down the pipeline. So I just try to hang in until it gets there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also like a bazillion different therapies. Um, mm. and it doesn't mean we you do them separate to ERP. It could mean that you in combination, like uh, except as a commitment therapy, often gets tied in with ERP. And for some people that approach to ERP really helps, you know, some, I bring in compassion focused therapy with some of my clients and that's what they need alongside ERP, um, and a million other things, you know? Um, Mm. so yeah, good answer. Um, you've got a billboard where you live in Massachusetts, right? No, New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. Sorry. (laughs) Good try. Good (laughs) try. Close enough. Close enough. It's the same, (laughs) same coast, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh you got a billboard in new jersey what do you want written on that billboard you know people warned me that you're gonna ask this question yeah. and i knew and i was like i'll get some inspiration um i think honestly i would pick my favorite ocd recovery mantra if you will i would just put it in really big bold letters which is values over fear yeah. I think people without OCD would benefit from that too. Just moving towards what they value instead of what they're afraid of. I think Mm -hmm. that could help people in their relationships um, because a lot of people are afraid of conflict. So they don't bring things up, which then makes everything worse. That's a way I could see it affecting people without OCD too. But I think if people did that, there might be a lot more action in the world, which might affect everybody positively yeah i like that absolutely um and then yeah so you could pick up the phone and call your let's do your 18 year old self okay what what would you tell her my 18 year old self um i would tell her that she has ocd (laughs) she should find an ocd specialist um there's a whole bunch of things I would tell her that she's OCD, should see an OCD specialist, should go to the IOCDF conference and get in DBT. 
uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. I've done that a couple of times. It's, mm-hmm. it's been very helpful um, in general. Uh, yeah, I just feel like you got to go to therapy and not just for OCD. Because I think sometimes I, I don't know if this happens to other people with OCD, but um, my therapist saw me like very specifically for that. Mm-hmm. And I had trouble branching out into other kinds of therapy from there and talking about things that were not OCD, like yeah. things that other people go to therapy for just like life transitions and relationship issues. Um, and I think I would have definitely encouraged that and not yeah. just going when I had a flare and then leaving. Cause that's what yeah. we used to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure many people can relate to that. Um, so uh lastly is there anything else you wish you could have said or shared today uh i don't think so i think i hopefully covered everything yeah no it's good it's brilliant talking to you and obviously like i said i'll put the links to the octopus in my show notes um yeah thank you for your story yeah thank you so much it's a great way to start my friday Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.